welcome everyone to this second installment of the 2022 construction arbitration series. I am uh, Rafael Carmona from the ICDR, and I want to take a moment before we begin to remind you that you can join us uh, on ICDR YNI Associate. Uh, you can go to our website. If you look for ICDR Young and International, you will find it. And in our website, you'll be able to find registration forms in English and in Spanish as well as the library of webinar programs with all of our previously recorded webinars. You can also join our LinkedIn group. Again, the name is ICDR Young and International, and you can request to join. Uh, once there, you'll be able to see all of the updates that we will be posting there too. I want to also thank our co-sponsors for this initiative, the ABA Forum on Construction Law, the Society of Construction Law North America, and why construction, uh, young international construction practitioners. Also special thanks to Zach Torres, who is the organizer of this series and who also will be our moderator today. In the unlikely event that you haven't heard of Zach, uh, he is a partner at Troutman Pepper Hamilton Sanders in uh, Philadelphia and New York, where he specializes in complex US domestic and international proceedings. He has experience with projects in the US Africa, the Middle East, and Latin America in connection with a wide variety of uh, projects, uh, including power plants, airports, commercial buildings, and other civil infrastructure work. He is also a regular author and speaker in the field of construction and international arbitration, and he is an adjunct professor at the School of Law at Villanova University. Uh, with that, Zach, we're looking forward to this program. Uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Rafa. Um, uh, thanks to everyone who's joined us today, uh, and obviously to our panelists. Um, this is, as Rafa said, this is our second year running uh, this construction arbitration series, and I'm sort of always thrilled uh, by the amount of attention sort of generated uh, and, and by really the, the breadth of the audience, which is really truly international. Um, we have people attending from all over the world. So, so thank you all for your interest. Um, and, and today, what we're going to really do is focus on uh, a subject of construction arbitration sort of near and dear to my own heart, just as someone starts to call me. Um, uh, we're gonna talk about how you manage, or the question of managing how these complex construction arbitrations that involve voluminous numbers of claims, you know, your 200 claim arbitration. And before I get go much further, that, though, I wanna introduce our panelists. Um, we've got Pat Galloway, Joe Campbell, and Ronan Hanna. Um, and, and let me just start by giving you sort of their their background. So let's start with Pat. Um, Dr. Galloway is, is a civil engineer, uh, an international chartered arbitrator, and a DRB member and mediator with over 40 years of experience specializing in energy and construction management. She is a fellow in the Com College of Commercial Arbitrators and is really the only non-lawyer elected to the college, uh, a member of the National Academy of Distinguished Neutrals, and a member of the, the Dispute Res or Review Board for Foundation. She's also a member of several Arbitral Institution panels, uh, including energy and construction and commercial panels for institutions like the ICDR, uh, AAA, ICC, the Ar Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, the LCIA, and CPR. Um, Dr. Galloway has also served on the AAA's Board of Directors from 2009 to 2020, um, and has lectured uh, on numerous occasions and published in numerous journals uh, on mediation and arbitration and received numerous rewards, including the AAA's Director of the Year. So Pat, thank you for joining us. Um, next up is, is Joe Campbell. Uh, Joe is counsel at Borden, Ladner, and Gervais in Toronto. Uh, he has over 13 years of experience working as a dedicated arbitrator and counsel and has represented cl clients in connection with high value and complex international and domestic arbitrations in a range of different industries, including energy and construction. Um, Joe previously worked at an international law firm um, based in Paris and in Singapore and then later in Abu Dhabi uh, and has worked as in-house counsel for a state of the oil company in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, Joe is a member of the Canadian Bar Association, is licensed in Ontario, and as well as in England and Wales. So Joe, thanks for joining us. Um, and last but not least is Ronan Hanna. Uh, Ronan is uh, an English barrister uh, who practiced at Atkin Chambers and is based in London. Um, Ronan specializes in construction and engineering disputes and acts for employers, contractors, and designers, uh, and regularly instructs, is regularly instructed by US clients operating internationally. Um, Ronan's practice has a particular focus on international arbitrations arising of large infrastructure and energy projects. 
Uh, and in the past 10 years, Rodin has been involved in some of the largest construction arbitrations in the Middle East and the CIS regions, including airports, metro systems, and oil and gas pipelines. Um, so Rodin, thank you. And, and thank you for, for all of you for, for joining us today. Um, and, and before I turn it over to the panelists, I wanted to sort of briefly set the stage about what we're talking about today and why this is important. What, you know, what is sort of the world of construction arbitrations? Um, really one of the most unique features about a construction arbitration, at least in my opinion, is, is really the sheer number of claims that can arise in connection with these matters. Um, you know, the volume and the diversity of the types of claims you get really is what makes this whole um, sphere, this whole field fascinating and sort of daunting in a lot of ways. Um, you know, each of these claims involve individual fact patterns, individual sets of evidence and raise different legal questions and really could all be their own mini arbitrations unto themselves. So managing that in one big omnibus arbitration can be a challenge. And, and in sort of in my experience, the volume of claims that arise out of construction arbitrations and construction disputes really is one of the reasons why the construction industry heavily relies on arbitrations in general. Um, you know, the courts and of themselves really aren't as well suited to manage sort of these large, complex construction arbitrations simply because of the number of claims that sort of arise in connection with these disputes. And so that all sort of leads to the question is how do you actually manage this process? Um, you know, and I, I'm obviously looking at this from the perspective outside counsel, and I think Ronan, Joe, and Pat, we've all sort of been in that position before. Pat, I think you've looked at it both from the expert side and from an arbitrator's perspective. Um, but, you know, this is a skill and this is an issue that isn't just unique to outside counsel, it's very relevant to in-house attorneys, uh, contract managers, and even experts. Um, and so the task of sort of gathering and distilling, presenting this information not only to arbitral tribunals, but really to counsel, so, you know, your, your, your counsel that you're working for, your client, you know, your own clients, experts, boards, is a skill that really has to be carefully developed and thought through. And, and so with that, I, I, I'm gonna turn it over to sort of our panelists in terms of how you, you manage this process, you know, really starting from the very beginning of you know, the pre-arbitration phase, um, going all the way through the proceedings and into hearings, well, how they step through that process, how they view that process, and how you sort of take this information and put it into a digestible form. And so I'm gonna start with Joe first. Um, and so Joe, you know, after that, that long wind up, um, you know, when a client comes to you and says, Joe, I've got, I've got this problem. I've got this huge construction case. I've got hundreds of claims I've got to deal with. We're probably gonna to have to pursue an arbitration against the other side. What do you do? You know, how do you start to approach that issue? So I think, you know, and, and just act, uh, first of all, I just want to thank you very much for um, to yourself and Raphael for uh, your work in organizing this series and also the invitation. Um, it's uh, it's a pleasure to be involved. So thank you very much. And also to sit with Dr. Galloway and also Ronan as well. Um, so really, when you first get involved in an arbitration, what do you do? I mean, at the end of the day, counsel needs to be nimble to really understand the context of what they're getting involved. They really need to quickly assess the scope of the work, uh, the client's objectives, and the best interests you know, during this critical phase. Uh, they need to understand what is the project? Where is it located? Who are the parties involved? Are you acting for the contractor or the employer? What is the status of the project and the dispute resolution process? And are there any other contextual or political factors which make this project particularly unique? So really that's the first key critical step to really getting involved in a project. Um, another key point too is, is really understanding at what stage of the case is, is counsel getting involved. Uh, the timing of the life of the project is key. Um, for instance, are the lawyers being called during an ongoing project or after its completion? Uh, you know, for instance, if it's the former, the council needs to get to, to grips quickly with the contract, ensure that all the formalities for submitting claims to arbitration are satisfied. Are the claims right? Um, and if it's the latter, council needs to quickly understand the state of the claims and where they are situated in the dispute resolution process. So, Zach, to answer your question, I think council needs to understand all these contextual and factors to and be nimble and, and proactive during this initial stage, just so that you set up your team and also your client for success during the process. And so Joe, how, how do you sort of just fall flowing off of that, 
when you say teams, you know, looking at it from an outside counsel's perspective, you know, how do you how do you actually structure a team? Like how do you, you know, get a team of whether it's partners or associates or paralegals or whomever or barristers and experts, like how do you start going about deciding you know, who you need, who is doing what, and how do you, you know, clear that with the client, make sure they understand you know, what you're doing and why you're doing it. Yeah, well, again, I think that, you know, it, I think that everyone on this panel um, and certainly in the audience will agree that, you know, no two cases are ever the same. You're always dealing with different clients, uh, different scopes of claims, different issues. So I think that ultimately, you know, the team really needs to understand what needs to be achieved, the scope of the issues, the, how many different claims are you dealing with? What's the documentary record like? Um, you know, what's the project record like? So I think that once you really assess, you know, this multitude of, of various factors, then, you know, it's, it's basically a project management skill. You, you need to be able to, to effectively understand the scope of the work that needs to be uh, completed and also understand what resources you have at your disposal, what the budget of your client is, uh, you know, in terms of how much have they dedicated to this process. Um, so, you know, I think it's really just understanding this whole kind of you know, matrix of, of factors. And, and ultimately it's a project management, uh, you know, decision that really needs to be assessed. So, yeah. Sure. And, and Joe, I guess one question that just sort of in terms of your own practices, um, you know, wh what do you want to see first from the client? Do you want to go and talk to people? Do you say, just give me all your documents? Do you say, give me all your emails? Like what's, what's your approach and start of trying to gather and get your arms around all of these claims that are going to be put to arbitration and really decided in some ways, you know, are some are some of these merited or some are not? How, how do you kind of go through that process? Yeah, I think, again, I think ultimately it depends on the context of, you know, the the mandate and the appointment and where the, you know, the actual case sits in the whole timeline of an arbitration matter from, from start to finish. Um, I've been involved in cases, in fact, with you, Mr. Torres Fowler, and also Ronan, where we were uh, appointed as counsel, I think upwards of a year and a half or two years before the notice to arbitrate was was filed. So, you know, during that process, we had uh, a very long lead time to actually go to the project site to work with the, the clients, uh, legal counsel, and also other project personnel to help develop all the claims, uh, to really understand the documentary record um, and, and, and really to help guide the arbitration before any kind of statement of claim was filed or, or anything like that. So again, I think that's ultimately that uh, the answer to your question depends on the context of the appointment, uh, depends on the context of, you know, where everything sits in, in the timeline. Um, I've been in, I've recently been involved in another case where we've essentially been appointed as counsel um, and we need to, you know, draft a, a, a statement of defense, you know, under a very, very short uh, timeline. Mm -hmm. um, and in, you know, in that case, you're just kind of prioritizing not necessarily different things because the best interest of your client is always, you know, the fundamental priority that you need to, to stick to. But certainly, you know, depending on the timeline of your appointment and the mandate and the project, et cetera, if it's ongoing, if it's already complete, I think that all these things just need to be factored in and and ultimately you need to come up with a game plan to to most effectively meet your clients needs and obviously that changes on a case-to-case -case basis sure um you know, joe how and pat and ronan feel free to jump in but but how, how important do you feel it is to sort of be embedded sort of be on the ground with you know a project team sort of working with them arm and arm do you think that's Super critical. And how do you think maybe the sort of the post-COVID world and you know Teams and Zoom has sort of affected that? And whether or not you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, I mean, I think it's extremely important to be embedded with your client and to get to know your client. Um, you know, per, uh, preferably on a face-to-face -face basis, uh, like we have. Uh, you know, Zach on the matters that we worked uh, you know together in the past. Um, but I think the criticality of that question ultimately depends on, you know, who who's your client and if your client is is arbitration savvy or not. 
So if they're not arbitration savvy and or, or maybe they're not even, you know, litigation savvy, then, you know, you really need to look at the project record and, 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 and look at things like our claims right for arbitration. You know, has the client followed all these fundamental steps to, you know, triggering arbitration and ensuring all the procedural steps have been satisfied? Um, conversely, you can have extremely sophisticated clients who have been down this road many, many times in the past. They've got extremely effective in-house counsel. They've got extremely effective contract managers. Um, and then it's just a matter of harnessing the information and just making sure that it, it's well organized. It's presented, obviously, and I won't get into that because I know that's that's Ronan's uh, a scope of responsibility for today. But again, I think it's really just knowing your client and and knowing what you need to do to do the best job for them possible. If if I could jump in there yeah. Zach, on on that question, I think um, from my experience, the better your relationship with a key witness, the more you will get out of them, and I think it's important for us all to bear in mind, given the profession we're in, that no one else likes lawyers. And when, when you're on a project and you're told that the lawyers are arriving to grill you about things that you did, about yeah, problems yeah. that you managed and so on, that, that will nine times out of 10 get people's back up. Because <laughs> nine, nine, nine times out of 10, they haven't dealt with lawyers before, certainly not in that level of detail. So you have an obstacle to climb in the first instance. Um, and because you, if they're a key witness, you're depending on them to tell you, for the benefit of your client, ultimately, tell you actually what happened. And if you build a good relationship with them and they, they feel they can trust you, you will get more out of them. And you might even find that the version of events is different than what it appears, maybe um, for the worse, but sometimes for the better. Um, so that, that's, I mean, that's my observation. It, it's, it's good to be on, on the ground. Um, I think yeah. uh, all the more so if the project is a live project. Then, as Joe says, it, it's a different um, situation altogether. It, um, if if claims are being issued, um, delay notices and so on on live events, the client will need a sophisticated legal team uh, on, on site. And actually, if, if you are on the ground early in that way, you can build up a relationship with the witnesses over a year or more before the litigation even begins in earnest. Yeah, and, sure. and you know, Zach, from an arbitrator's perspective, the arbitration panel can actually tell whether or not the witnesses have a relationship with, with counsel or their client. I mean, it is so apparent at, to us as to whether or not there has been, quote, coaching or real understanding of the facts. Or when you look at people's expressions, whether you're seeing that what's coming out of the witness's mouth is a surprise to everybody around the room. Um, and, you know, and it's, it's difficult to tell you whether or not that does or doesn't have any impact um, on the arbitration panel's um, decision-making process, but it does sort of key you into, well, let's look at the evidence and see if that evidence is actually matching with what's coming out of the witnesses' mouths. And so um, it, it does come across whether or not um, you can tell some time has been spent with the witnesses or not. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you guys another. This is sort of slightly related topic, but sort of pre-arbitration sort of information gathering. So obviously you want to sort of speak to your witnesses. Um, I mean, one of the first people I always try to talk to is sort of the contract managers, because they're the ones who oftentimes have a general sense of what's going on. And then you sort of branch out beyond that to sort of figure out who are the key witnesses. But what about documents? Like how do you go about collecting sort of the key documents? Do you sort of rely on your client to give you the key information? Or do you sort of say, you know, give me all your emails, um, which which would sort of be the practice in the United States is, you know, we need to start taking all of your inbox emails and in international arbitration, that isn't always the norm. So how, how do you sort of go about doing this, especially on sort of a, a project in light of, you know, what Ronan said, which is no one likes lawyers. So you know, how do you go about convincing people, you, you need to share information with me. Um, we can do it the easy way or the hard way. Um, but but what, what's the process that you follow, Joe and Ronan and Pat? Well, you know, obviously having a, a well-running um, document management system is, is just about the most critical thing you can have in, in any, you know, large arbitration. Um, so I think that this has to be tackled, uh, you know, very early. Uh, you need to obviously explain all the importance uh, procedural steps and, and how a good management uh, 
a good document management system will pay dividends down the road during arbitration, uh, during a, a document production, and will actually save costs. So um, what I would suggest to clients is to invest in a platform such as Relativity or you know, some other similar platform where you can take large swaths of information from them and then allow the lawyers to triage that information you know, effectively using keyword searches. Um, another thing that's been really effective on a recent case that I've been involved in is that we've actually gotten, uh, the lawyers have gotten direct access to the, the client's internal project document system. So, you know, we had to go through all the security clearances. We obviously had to learn how to navigate that system, learn the structure of the documents, determinations, instructions, et cetera. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, as, as Ronan very rightly said earlier, um, you know, the, these, these project personnel, um, sometimes they have a complicated relationship with lawyers. Sometimes they're working on troubled projects and already have, you know, massive amounts of, of their own day-to-day -day work, let alone, you know, feeding documents to lawyers. So I think that this has been a really effective tool uh, in a recent matter I've been involved in. Um, and, and again, it's, it's really worked seamlessly to just give the lawyers direct access, um, but yeah. And, and Joe, one other question, and I, I, I'll probably tell you what I'm, I'm thinking, but I'm, I'm curious if I can get, get it out of you uh, by, by examination, but, but are, are there any particular tools that you think are useful just for sort of organizing all of this information, sort of in shorthand? Um, like, is there, you know, a, a practice that you use when you're sort of saying, I have a hundred claims, how do I understand what these claims are about? How do I understand what the exhibits are, the documents are, and wh how do you go about sort of putting that together in some usable format that you can reference in the future? Yeah, well, I think if you're lucky, um, the, the project is already going to have like an effective claims management system where you know claims are numbered accordingly and and you know documents when they're issued to the other side or when they cross the line are are, are issued a particular you know claim notice number or or whatever so then you know lawyers can take that you know that suite of information organize it on their own system and then ultimately it's up to you, it, you know, it's up to the lawyers to, you know, triage the claims by, by claims that have a high strategic value or a high monetary value. And, and, and you just plan your time accordingly on that basis. Uh, you devote your, re your resources accordingly. And, um, and, ultimately, and ultimately you just need to understand the claims and understand what's key and what's not. And, I mean, one one trick that we always use is, uh, is is creating chronologies because once you create a chronology of the key documents from the outset, then you know you can learn the story and and learn the claim as it evolved over time. And I think that that's really I really don't think that there's any other substitute for really getting to grips with the facts, and especially when you're working on construction projects, the complex technical issues, which uh, many lawyers don't have an engineering background, including myself. Uh, so, so really, you know, you really need to devote time to understanding, you know, what is the spec of a particular, you know, point or what is the issue that you really need to understand. So again, I think that just covering all those basics is, is critical. Yeah. One, one of the things I always do is I have, you know, a series of letters, for example, I always put them, you know, I, I, I'll reformat the title and, Microsoft, where it's, you know, year, month, day, and then you can sort, and then you just read the letters chronologically. That's a very quick way that I've always found to sort of at least get some sense of what the trends, what, what, what the trends were, what the timeline was, at least in sort of the formal written correspondence, knowing, of course, that there's always background uh, that isn't sort of, sort of found in those, in those letters. Yeah, and you know, awesome. Zach, that's what I do as well as an arbitrator. I always do a chronology, and I, I do it um, with the with the panel. So all the submissions from the claimants will be like in black font as well, and um, do that, you know, chronological with the exhibits and witness statements and um, facts or, or events that come out of those submissions, and then take the respondents. Um, submissions and everything, and put that in red font. It's very interesting to an arbitration panel because 
we then can see what evidence was or was not included by a particular party on a particular um, event or issue, which is pretty telling. And then we overlay on top of that chronology, anything that comes out of the expert reports or joint report and put that in there as well, including the technical experts. And it really, really helps hone in on us of truly what happened when and gives us a complete story of, of all of the events surrounding that. Yeah. Let me, let me shift gears a little bit. So away from pre-arbitration, but now we go, you know, we're filing, we're filing our, our demand, we're filing our RFA. Um, you know, Ronan, what do you think it takes to sort of start thinking about how you present this during an arbitration, even, you know, pre-hearing stage and during sort of the hearing and sort of leading up to the hearing when it comes to advocacy? And what are the things about, you know, a, a 200 claims as you go through that process. I think the biggest risk for any very large construction arbitration is that the legal team and the tribunal become lost in it. I think that's the single biggest risk. And I, I heard of a, an ICC arbitration hearing recently where on day nine or something of the, the evidentiary hearing, the tribunal came in and to asked or told the parties, I'm sorry, everyone, but we're lost here. We don't know what's going on. Um, and that, that's the biggest danger. That's a car crash for both sides. Um, a lot of ink can be spilled by lawyers on what the golden rules are for successful litigation arbitration. Um, I'll suggest three. You can have a think about, about it in due course. The first is frame a narrative. The second, follow the money. And the third, help the tribunal. Now, one might say, well, those are rules that just generally apply to every litigation. And that's true. Um, but the, the demands in applying those rules successfully is a bit more tricky on a very large case. So frame a narrative to take that to, to begin with. Um, the risk of very large cases is what I would call atomization of the dispute. So that what ends up being presented to the tribunal is not a case, but rather 200 atomized individual claims. Uh, and you open the case on the basis of saying to the tribunal, I'm sorry, um, each claim is an idiosyncratic, it needs to be decided on its own facts and its own merits. Well, it is true, every claim is ultimately decided on its own facts and merits, uh, but you want to build a narrative around that. I did a case last year, uh, it was sizable. The, um, was I, I see arbitration in the Middle East. The other side's written opening submissions were 5,000 pages, possibly 7,000. It's so, it was big, number became so big, it became irrelevant. They were four feet high piled up in my desk. And, the, and they, they proceeded largely on the basis of claim one, 50 pages, claim two, 50 pages, and so on. Um, ours were substantial, but nothing of that of that order. And I thought that is a document that it seems to me is very unhelpful to the tribunal. One, there's absolutely no chance of being able to read it before the hearing begins or possibly ever, but also it, it doesn't draw the threads of the case together. Um, the, the dispute is greater than the sum of its parts. If you look at only each individual claim in turn, you will miss the bigger picture. And as advocates, that's a missed opportunity because your ultimately, ultimate objective should be to thread facts and events together into a narrative and to pitch that narrative to the tribunal and hopefully pitch it in a way that makes you the good guy. Because the most, well, one of the most successful things you can do is if you walk out of a hearing and say, we have established, I think that we're the good guy, then you know that good results are going to follow. Um, the tribunal, if they think the merits are with you, they will make 50 50 calls in your favor they will find creative ways through legal problems to help you and so on because you're the good guy and you'll never establish you're the good guy in the dispute by looking at each dispute in an atomized way they need the bigger picture and all tri all tribunals well i think almost all tribunals are ultimately merits minded they they're sitting there wanting to find out i think who the good guy is and they want you to help them doing so to do so and look at every one of those 200 claims in an individualistic way is not going to help that. Um, the, I mean, as, as Joe mentioned, um, chronologies, a key thing, 
um, something that's as a mistake that's often made is not putting forward a story that's in any way chronological. I mean, in that case, that opening, it was, you know, there was no overall chronology. There were many chronologies for each claim, but no overall chronology. But it's the overall picture that allows the claimant, so that allows the tribunal to say that, for example, you as claimant were massively messed around with continuous changes. Or that if you're the employer, maybe the contractor had continuous cash flow problems. It, it's a, events that are repetitive throughout the chronology, only stepping back and telling the story end to end. Can you actually see that? Um, and that, 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 that requires the chronological story to be told in writing at some point. Um, maybe it's in your pleadings, although that's quite an early stage for it to be told. Maybe it's in a couple of key witness statements, but more likely, and I see arbitrations anyway, it will be in a very big written opening. And certainly in, in the English legal tradition, the first and maybe the biggest component of any written opening will be a very chunky chronology. And the, re the rest of it then piggybacks off of that. So when, it, when you turn then to discuss claim one, you can actually say, well, the paragraphs X and Y or sections X and Y above in the chronological part of this opening, you've had all the facts on claim number one. Now let me tell you about the legal issues or the technical expert issues or quantum. Um, so there, there can be um, synergies between the different sections of the, of the written openings. That's how we like to, to present things. And uh, you do want to, have, you want some, we want people in your written opening to say, there's some key narratives. I'm going to develop them at the hearing and they're as follows. Cash flow, continuous change, um, no baseline program was set down at the start, whatever, important things. The, so that, that's the first um, issue, framing a narrative. The second, follow the money. Joe has already alluded to this. Uh, it's, it, it's not just a question of looking at the value of your claims, but also balancing that with merits. And also balancing it with cost proportionality too, and time. Um, because all, the, the sheer scale of these disputes means that there will always be a degree of time pressure. Um, one of the things that crops up, I find a lot, is the fact that there will be the large claims, and then there will also be a host of smaller claims. And they can, they can turn to be a thorn in everyone's backside. Uh, and it's a good idea, I think, if you can get the tribunal on board to try and case manage those smaller claims at an early stage. They, they may be actually small in, in, on any view in the sense that they're each only worth a few thousand dollars. They may be small in relative terms, the delay and disruption claim might be $300 million. The smaller claims are three, four, 500,000 each in relative terms, very small, not perhaps in not nominal terms. What can be done about those? Um, how should they be pleaded out? How should they be managed by the tribunal? Uh, are, are there openings for the parties to reach some agreements on them? I mean, what, things I've seen done in the, in the last few years are the tribunal might direct those smaller claims to be, are to be heard and determined after the main claims. And that's largely in the expectation that once the big stuff is determined by the tribunal, the parties can agree the rest. That's not, that's quite sensible. Uh, another um, option, which more commercial option, is that the parties agree early on that um, there's a set of smaller claims and what the claim that will be awarded on those is a formula. So as it were, you agree a formula. It, if you win 50% of your big claims, then you'll automatically be awarded by the tribunal 50% of your smaller claims. And that, it, well, that's creative. You, <laughs> it's creative, but the um, to defendant that might seem mad initially, and the, there might be a certain mindset on the part of defendants. No, no, no. I want to put the claimant to the pain of having to plead out and evidence each of those claims, and that that can seem like a very good idea tactically at the start, but then uh, the, the the circle turns and you have to respond to those, and it can be cost disproportionate and time disproportionate way. So I think one, one corollary of following the money is also that no, try, trying to case manage at an early stage to avoid wasting too much time and money on where the money isn't. Um, the third, third thing I want to touch on is helping the tribunal. It's almost a given that for claims of this size, you will not be able to ventilate every claim at the oral hearing. It's simply not going to happen. And it wouldn't be a good idea for you, even if you could, because it would result in a sort of scattergun approach. Um, two things I would suggest. Uh, one is deciding as early as possible what the big claims are you want to focus on in your written openings and in your oral advocacy. And that's a little, that's a, a follow on event from following the money, determined claims you want to focus on. And then signposting in your written openings where 
to the tribunal that you're going to focus on those. That's helpful for the tribunal because then in their pre-hearing reading, they know which claims to look at and which they can ignore. And then the tribunal will almost inevitably ask you, well, how do I decide the claims that haven't received attention at the hearing? What am I going to, you know, how am I going to decide those? Um, they'll have to be decided on paper, inevitably. What's a good tool for assisting the tribunal with that? Something I've seen used quite a lot are, are what um, we in England at least would call a claim schedule. So it's imagine an Excel spreadsheet that's populated with all the claim numbers and for each of those, all the references in the submissions and the openings and the evidence, expert and witness. So the tribunal can read across for a given claim um, and find out by itself where all the evidence is, if it was going to sit down on a given day and decide that particular claim, which it will need to do at some point. And that's a really useful tool um, to, to and allow, allow some of those smaller, uh, or you would say less important claims to be taken off the table and you can safely tell the tribunal, here are the references, this is your roadmap to, to deciding this particular claim. Ron, let me, let me ask you a couple questions uh, uh, just about more sort of nuts and bolts of, of your views on, on these claims. I mean, the, the thing you led off with was the, your story of the 7,000 page uh, written opening. Like, how do you avoid that type of, of document? Because obviously it's, it's so large that it's probably useless to the arbitrators, especially if it's an opening, right? They're never going to read it before they get to the hearing. And that, that oftentimes has been, in my experience, a very similar, well, I've had a very similar experience where you have these robust submissions that in truth the arbitrators neither have the time or the patience to read through in any real amount of detail to educate themselves before you know whether it's a five-day hearing a 20-day hearing a 30-day hearing they can be you know exhausted just by the, the sheer amount of volume of information is it you know is, is it a process of triage where you just focus on the big claims and sort of let the smaller claims to the side is it you know flag post or, or, or flagging for the arbitrators that listen we're going to put this, these these smaller claims on the paper for your review later on. We're not going to focus on them here. Like, how do you make that type of submission useful? In it, you know, in and of itself, it has to be. If it has to be a seven thousand page submission, or do you just sort of avoid that tactic altogether and focus on another avenue? I, I think by hook or by crook, you would need to avoid um, an overly long set of submissions that is just directed at going through each of the claims in turn. Um, I mean, I've, I've seen openings frequently where it is said we are not covering X, Y, Z claims. Um, and that, that is because there are piles of paper that have already been submitted to you um, in relation to those. You may have a claim schedule that tells you where all that evidence is. Um, but it, it, I suppose it comes back to applying those rules. Um, if, if you know the narrative you want to frame and you're following the money and identifying where your key claims are, then you tell the tri tribunal that in an open way, in the introduction to your, uh, to your written openings or your oral openings, you might say, this, this case really is about three or four big issues, and they're as follows. Uh, un under those three or four issues, there might be 50 claims grouped, but there's a common thread to all of them. And if you're with us on that common thread, if you find, for example, that the employer ran out of money, or we were wrongfully terminated, some, some key thread, then you will decide most of this case in our favor. And, and Rhoda, maybe even more technical, do, do you, I mean, you're obviously an English barrister and sort of you're sort of trained in the UK pleading standard where you sort of have an initial pleading followed by witness statements. And sometimes you might have some legal submission like statement of claim built into that process. But do you prefer that process? Do you think that process lends itself to this sort of construction arbitration, 200 claim type scenario or more of a memorial type submission where you've basically got everything in one big single statement of claim with your expert reports and witness statements? Um, or, or do you think it matters? I mean, do you think the, the format of the written submission process even makes any real difference for this type of dispute? It makes a huge difference. Um, people's preferences will largely be driven by the domestic environment they're coming from. So from England, yes, we have a style that's similar to the US, pleadings followed by discovery, followed by um, witness evidence, followed by written expert reports and so on. Um, but um, individuals from more civil law backgrounds, whether that be Mideast, Continental Europe, South America, with a very different view. And arbitrators from those 
jurisdictions will think, as you mentioned, in the more the memorial salon, that maybe some people watching that that haven't come across that concept before. Um, in in essence, it means you get everything you ever want to say, more or less, your pleadings, all your documents, all your witness evidence, all your expert evidence, and submitted in one go as claimant. Then the other the respondent gets a chance to to respond, and there might be a reply in due course. Um, it's an attractive approach to clients sometimes because they can, lawyers can budget and say, well, I just need six months, I need X million dollars, and I'll produce your case for you. Um, it, I think it struggles to accommodate these very large construction disputes. When I've seen it used, the difficulty is that with such a multiplicity of claims, your understanding as a legal team, sometimes as a client team, develops over time. Um, and you can actually see that if you, you know, think about going through the, the normal pleading style process, you can, you'll, you'll remember everyone this, uh, on this call will remember uh, claims where they've pleaded out, maybe we're not in full understanding what, what the claim entailed. And by the time you go through disclosure, or discovery, witness evidence and expert reports, you have a totally different understanding of the claim and maybe what the key points are in it. Um, and that, that evolutionary process is very useful. Um, and in fact, that's, that's what the process is directed to achieve, but instead trying to compress the production of your, all your claims and the entirety of your case into a three, six month process, and you simply shoot it off in one bolt, that, that could be a recipe for disaster, especially if you're a claimant. Sure. So let me, let me shift gears a little bit, because I, I do want to give Pat some time. And, and, and Rune, I think what you said, Pat has probably a lot of experience with a lot of opinions about. So I, I do want Pat to have a chance to sort of weigh in. But, but Pat, so, you know, from an arbitrator's perspective, you know, you get an RFA or you get a demand, and you say, oh man, this is, I've got, you know, 200 claims I have to resolve. I, I sure hope this council knows what they're doing because I don't want to <laughs> have to suffer through this process. What, 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 what do you think is useful to you? You know, whether it's, you know, a memorial type approach, a statement of claim or a pleadings type approach, you know, how do you feel like you should structure the hearing? What are the things that you look for to help you manage this volume of information uh, in deciding these cases? Well, first of all, I think your arbitration panel should be shot allowing a 7,000 or 5,000 page submission. <laughs> Uh, we always try to work with the parties early on um, on generally getting an agreement on some type of a, you know, page limit on the submissions, even though recognizing it may have appendices or certain types of attachments or all of that, because as you said, um, if it becomes so overwhelming for the, the panel that there's not the time to, to read it, then it's a disservice not only to your client but to the arbitration panel and then nobody actually is able to to grasp what's before them but what we do um, typically try to do whether it's the panel we prefer if the parties do it but often we find ourselves as panels doing it is that's to develop something that's called a scott schedule very um, familiar in international arbitration very very effective for multiple claims. And this is where we try to group the claims into themes, because some of the claims, as you said, Ronan, I mean, there may be, you know, 30 or 40 particular claims, but they generally fall under um, a certain category, you know, whether that um, be um, a, a defect category, whether it be a delay category, whether it be some other type of um, technical issue category, whether it's, you know, a an IP issue. I mean, there's there's all sorts of um, think productivity, but to group those claims into what I would call major themes of the of the case, and then underneath of that, um, basically it's as you said, you know, an Excel spreadsheet. I try to you know use a a, a word a table where we list out the um, the claimants, you know, major theme, all the individual claims underneath the claimant's position. Um, next column would be all the relevant evidence that uh, supports that particular issue. Then the next column is the respondent's um, position corresponding with their exhibits. And then you have a quantum column, which of course attaches the dollars with that particular claim. And then of course the arbitration panel of course has its own columns at the end relative to how they're gonna decide the issue and, and what quantum they may um, adjust to that. But what we typically like to do, if the parties don't agree to do this on their own, 
at some point the panel will present its table to the parties and that may not happen until you've seen the um, original um, notice and the response and reply, we may wait until all of that's done, but then present that to the parties to one, make sure we have all the issues that we've identified them all correctly, that the parties agree that the positions that we've set forth are correct and that the exhibits um, set forth are correct. But that provides a guideline for us. One, we can make sure we address everything. Um, two, we haven't missed everything, and we are fairly um, representing each party's position on those particular items. So I find that particularly helpful when there's a lot of issues before to just help keep track and carp, um, to categorize them if you have suggested, Ronan. Um, but on another latter point where you, um, um, the both of you talked about smaller claims and how you package those, one of the other um experience that I had, it was actually on a domestic case in the United States, but the, we had hundreds of claims, $5,000 or under, where the bigger claims were clearly, you know, 75, 100 million, whatever. And we're just like grasping going, really? We are going to talk about a $500 issue? I mean, it's going to cost more to talk about it than it is <laughs> to award it. So, we actually, the parties, we did have a retired judge as the chair. The parties had appeared in front of him before, but we all agreed that one thing that we would be willing to do is that all of the claims that were $100,000 and below, we did a, and I'll call it an ARME because we were first set up as an arbitration panel, but then what we agreed to do is those smaller claims would be mediated with the chair and the parties, they would be done in, in lumps. And then there would, um, the other wing arbitrator and I, we had no input into that, um, those discussions or what went on. What we did do is settle, uh, sign the order that uh, when they agreed upon that. And we did all of those before the major hearing. And it worked out really, really well. They were able to resolve and get rid of all of their small claims below $100,000 before we ever started the merits hearings on the on the bigger issues. And so I found that to be another interesting, um, really creative method that worked well. Obviously, you have to have a lot of trust between your um, the tribunal members, you have to have trust between the parties, uh, but we found it to be extremely effective and both both parties were extremely um, happy about that. So those are a couple things that we talked about and going something that, that Joe said, um, I also, and not all tribunal members agree with this approach, but luckily some of them that work in the international sector tend to favor it a little bit more. And that is fact witness conferencing. We all know a lot about joint, you know, hot tubbing of experts and putting them together but people don't think quite as much about um, adding the fact witnesses and whether you're going to be adding them with the experts or whether you're going to be putting counterparts um, to each other. But it can also be extremely valuable and very efficient to getting to some of those bigger issues for which there will be views on each side by a similar position on each side. And it allows the, the tribunal to actually hear those events and the evidence from those perspectives at the same time, which makes it much more efficient in our mind when we're trying to deliberate a particular issue and also allows the panel to ask questions um, of the two people at the same time that are you know fact specific. So that's another uh, means that we have found to really handle these very large claims. Let me let me go back to one thing you said, Pat, earlier about sort of triaging and sort of settling and resolving these low value claims, which is really sort of one of the, the big themes I've sort of picked up from all of you during the course of this, this conversation. And this sort of relates to one a question, a question that one of the, the, the attendees has raised, and, and I'll sort of paraphrase it, but the, the idea, at least the comment is that, um, you know, sane employers and sane contractors should really look at the cost benefit analysis of actually prosecuting and defending these claims. Um, and that, you know, if you have rational actors, they're going to want to try and resolve these things without actually having to spend all of the expense of, you know, engaging counsel, engaging experts, going through and trying to prove all these claims up in an arbitration. I think that is true, at least at a very high level. 
But it is a practical matter. I find that when you have a really contentious project, that is often harder to achieve than not. And I think you know, techniques like Pat described, running what you described are ways to go about that. But but how often do you find that to be the case where you know, you've, you've just got such an entrenched position on both sides? Or, or on the other hand, say you have like an owner and employer where the owner simply is withholding a small amount of money that they know isn't worth actually chasing uh, from the claimant side. Um, how do you sort of deal with these types of issues really as, at a practical level to get the parties to sort of come together and realize, is it worth prosecuting these claims? And if, it's, if, it, if it isn't, how do you get them to an outcome that makes the most sense um, in terms of cost benefit um, analysis? I think it personally takes a really good um, case management aspect from the tribunal to get the parties to recognize that. I mean, both parties know that the tribunal is going to be making the ultimate decisions here. And despite how contentious relationships might be, and believe me, I've been in a few where relationships appear to be quite contentious, knowing that they're looking at the decision maker, they tend to pay attention to what the decision makers are requesting of them to do in order to help them make the best decision. And so with a good panel that recognizes that this cost benefit analysis is really important. And, and sometimes we will even do it for them. I mean, we will, we will calculate in our mind the cost in that room on an hourly basis. And then we will take the some of the claims and we will basically show how ludicrous it is to be spending this much money to resolve claims that are a fraction of the hourly costs that the parties are actually paying. And when we can get the, the ultimate parties who we kind of insist be in the room when this discussion is going on to recognize this, I think it actually really has a psychological impact on the ultimate client who then is more willing to consider alternatives on how to best resolve those without doing them on an independent, whether it's a formula, as Ronan has said, whether it's the ability to go away and settle them, whether it's this Mead ARB or ARB Mead, you know, um, suggestion, I think that really depends on the particular case at hand, and it depends on the on the parties. And as I said, it contends a lot on the trust between the parties and the trust between the, the tribunal members. But I always think that there is a method and a way to be able to, to do that. But I think a lot of it requires the tribunal's um, initial input into the party's thinking and to get them thinking of different ways to potentially do this. Whether it's done at the beginning, whether it's done at the end, I don't know if that's um, as relevant as getting the parties to agree to do it. And to, and to box those together. But I do think it's critically important when you're talking about these massive claims, the amount of money that they are spending um, on, an, on an hourly and a daily basis to try to whittle those off and get those resolved in a different, more efficient manner. So let me ask this to, to Joe and Ronan. So in Pat's scenario, you've got you know, a third party neutral who's willing to sit there and tell the other party, you know, go settle these now. Or you're gonna, you're gonna, we're gonna split the baby, or we're gonna do whatever, and you're not gonna, neither you're gonna like the result. So you go and try and figure out what the resolution should be. What happens, sort of, in, in the scenario of counsel? Or, you know, Ronan is, is a barrister. You know, prior to the, even the appointment of an arbitrator, or even sort of in the very interim stages of an arbitration, what can you do, to sort of, get parties to sort of come together and manage these low value claims. You know, one party simply says, I don't want to settle these, go chase me for the money. Or you have a client that says, I'm not going to pay, I'm not going to take anything less than, you know, a hundred cents on the dollar. How do you, how do you sort of manage that dynamic? Well, I, I'll just step in first. I think the first thing is to, is to just complete a, a proper merits assessment of all the claims. And, and, and then contrast that merits assessment versus the amount in dispute for each particular claim. And, and as Pat just said, it, it's ultimately a cost benefit analysis. And if, if the client doesn't understand these, these um, you know, clear kind of you know, financial time you know, elements, then I think that's, uh, you know, that's something that just needs to be cleared with them ultimately at, at the beginning and if they understand great if they don't then obviously you need to come up with more creative ways but that's certainly my first 
uh, would be my first, uh, you know, step in the process. Mm. I, th- I mean, for my part, it's obviously a difficult conversation to have with a client before you even issued your notice of arbitration to give up some of its claims. The most tricky situation is where there's a huge multiplicity of small claims, but they actually add up to quite a few millions of dollars altogether. That's the trickiest situation. Yeah. Um, and no, no client wants to be giving something away before it's even begun. I think it's, it's a question of like a very open conversation with them about costs um, and making them realize for those smaller claims how hard fought they might be if the other side choose to do so. That the simply instructing an expert to look at one of them might exceed the cost of the claim itself. Um, I, I think Patricia's point was interesting that when you said, Patricia, that solutions can be reached on those smaller bulk of claims if both sides are commercial. And I think that that might be a key insight for this reason. If, um, assume you're a claimant, if the respondent is a sophisticated commercial party who's quite similar to you as a claimant, then you might expect they're going to do a deal like that. But it depends on who the respondent is. Um, there are entities you might be saying that it might be harder to get them to come to the table and do a deal early on on small claims that would recognize they're on the hook for at least some money. And I have in mind a particular, I mean, per, perhaps um, entities from a very different cultural uh, or national or, or governments or state-backed entities where the, the mechanics of bureaucracy moving so slow, it can be very difficult to get the permissions and the authorization of the government or state-backed entity to agree to pay money, especially at the start of an arbitration and an early case management. So perhaps something to think about but before embarking on 200 claims, which add up in totality to 2 million, might be how is the other side going to respond to this? Are they going to be sensible and commercial? Or are they going to draw a line in the sand and make me plead out and prove all of those? If it's the latter, that might end up being a disproportionate disaster for the client, and it's better off they don't do it in the first place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let, me, let me take off a couple more questions. I know we're sort of running out of time, and I like to keep this sort of an hour, uh, an hour timeline. Um, what, one question, um, maybe this is just sort of rapid fire for you guys. Ronan, you'll, you'll sort of know what a skeleton argument is. But w- what is your view on sort of using skeleton arguments? Uh, and, and page limits for legal briefs when sort of keeping on the theme of the 7,000 page submission that you, you described earlier. And do you like page limits or do you think um, they sort of unreasonably constrain your ability to put forward the case? It's coming from the UK because an American, I think, would view page limits as quite useful. I think that's very common here. I mean, the, 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 the 5,000 page written opening, is, I mentioned it's an, it's, it was exceptional. Um, pros and cons. Um, there will there will sometimes be a page limit imposed, and you genuinely say that doesn't give this case the credit that it deserves, and it will be difficult. It might actually be difficult to help the tribunal within that page limit. Um, I, I think per, if it was me, uh, if, if, if uh, I would suggest the tribunal that page limits for closings are probably more important than for openings. Um, a, a, good, a good opening can be a permanent resource for the tribunal. It can be something that in your written closing, you say, please go back and read our opening. Um, the case was set out there. You may say, we actually proved it at trial. Here are the transcript references. That would mean that, that's, an, that's an effective closing. The danger with um, long closings is that they're used as a vehicle by the parties to develop or change their case. I think that's why tribunals often impose page limits. Um, but by the end of the hearing, if the, if, uh, if the tribunal was properly helped, if the openings were good, closings don't need to, to run for thousands of thousands of pages or even for multiple rounds. I mean, that's, that's another very common thing to be ordered in IC arbitrations and multiple rounds of closings. I think most advocates will tell you that after the first round, it becomes a waste um, because you're simply recycling arguments. Mm-hmm. So I, I, it, I mean... 5,000, 7,000 pages, whatever it was, it should never have happened. But realistically, no tribunal would have necessarily expected that. Um, the, the, I mean, the, again, all the rest for the tribunal, I suppose, is that if you set a page limit and, and, and you set a high one, like 2,000 pages, the parties will work to fill it. Um, if, I mean, if you have experienced advocates uh, in front of you as a tribunal, I think you ha- normally have to trust that they're going to know what you need to 
have put in front of you and what how long it needs to be and how, how detailed it needs to be. Um, again, you know, Patricia has mentioned trust a couple of times. There has to be trust not only within the tribunal, but also between the tribunal and the advocates. And if, if that's built up, then by the time you get to the final directions hearing, the tribunal shouldn't need, shouldn't feel the need to shackle the advocates and tell them precisely how to run their case. No, 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 no. And, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I wasn't talking about a 50 page page limit on, on, on openings. And remember, I did, I did preface it by indicating we ask counsel to meet and confer and sort of agree as to what might be a, a reasonable um, page limit, whether that's 150, it's 200 or, or 300 or whatever. But the reason I say that is because I have been in several matters where I believe one party was not treated equitably because one party did submit several hundred pages, the other being from a different nationality who was more used to probably having smaller and thinking that smaller um, was all that should be submitted, um, I don't think was given the full opportunity to present its case, as you said, Ronan, and we felt that um, it, it wasn't really a fair submission, yet here we are. I mean, we couldn't say, oh, by the way, you know, you can supplement because that leads to all other kinds of issues, as both of you are aware. So that's why we just, we encourage the parties to meet and confer and come up with a, a reasonable suggestion, um, you know, plus or minus, right? So that both parties at least are submitting on a, what I would call an equal plane basis. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I see that. Well, let me get you last one last question that the, the audience raised, and, and this may be shorter. I, I don't have the answer off the top of my head, but are, are there any other, we mentioned, Joe, I think, and Ronan, you mentioned relativity. Um, are there any other sort of platforms that you have seen uh, being used that you, you found useful in the context of these? Uh, large construction arbitrations well i mean for i, I mean relativity is the main one that i've worked with recently uh i worked with one called concordance uh quite some time ago which i didn't think was as effective uh you know for for triaging documents and for um you know and for managing you know project documents now on the internal side of clients, I find the Aconnect system works extremely well. And, and, and that is, you know, that's, uh, I alluded to previously about having access to a client's internal system, and, and that was an Aconnect system. And I, you know, it, it's, it, it's seamless for, you know, external parties provided they've gone through the, uh, you, know, you know, the various security clearances to access, uh, you know, a project record, you can, take any particular letter, determination, decision, whatever you want. It's it, it's at, at your fingertips and very user friendly. So those are the ones that I've, you know, been uh, had the most, um, you know, positive experiences with. Uh, over the last couple of years, I've done a number of um, fully electronic trials and, and fully online using the, the Opus system. Yeah. Um, they should probably be paying me to give that plug for them, um, but it, uh, it, which it is useful because it's, it combines the transcription with a, a document management system um, and also electronic presentation at the hearing. So you, you get all, all three in one in one area. So whether you want to look up today's transcript, search for a document or present something, you just go into the one portal online. Uh, I mean, I, and I thought the, the search um, function was as good, uh, as good as relativity, which is probably, as, as Joe says, the market leader. I have a question. Sorry. No, I'll go ahead, Zach. It's just, I, I kind of wanted to go slightly off piece just on one last little point that I had a question for both Ronan and, and Pat. No, I, all, all I was going to say is, um, that there's, there's a lot of technology development, especially in sort of the e-discovery space that's gone on in the last 10 years where the level of sophistication of like AI and all of these other sort of platforms, I don't have them off the top of my head. Certainly I know um, that the individuals in sort of our e-discovery department have just a massive amount of tools out that that really help them sort of sort through this information. But, but, but that was all I was gonna say, so go ahead, Joe. It, it, it was just really just to piggyback on on what uh, on what Rona had said about using Opus and and also just and I'm sure that this uh, you know particular question's probably been debated ad nauseum you know over the last couple of years but 
Pat and Ronan, what's really your experience in, in the effectiveness of, of all these online hearings that you would have conducted, you know, over the past two years? And do you think that, you know, going forward, we'll see more of them, less of them, or do you think we'll get back to the more traditional kind of setting in person, et cetera? Well, from my personal experience, they went very well. Um, you know, one of the things we're talking about electronic, I mean, the panel would always ask the, the parties to whether um, it was a, a thumb drive or a hard drive to organize the documents, you know, for us so that it was easily retrievable. And we would typically have two screens or maybe even three screens up at a time. And they, they were va valuable. And I make two comments relative to the online um, arbitrations, both pros and cons. From a pro standpoint, the one thing that I think wasn't as obvious as it probably has become is that the tribunal actually has a much clearer view of the witness testifying because mm. they are truly up front in your face and you can see every little detail about every single person, um, but their expression, their eyes, their, um, and so from a witness standpoint, it was quite telling, but saying that the little tiny thumbnails that are on the rest of it of everybody else in the room um, is basically impossible to try to keep track of at the same time and to see reactions and to see facial. And so I really just think it highly depends on the matter at hand. There are certain arbitrations that I believe still can go forward virtually and probably should go before virtually, whether it's because there's few witnesses or there are um, few claims at hand. Um, they're not necessarily, I mean, everything obviously is contentious. You're in arbitration, but they're not um, overly contentious. But when there are lots of matters and lots of witnesses and lots of people, I think we will probably see it go back to in-person hearings because it's extremely important for the tribunal to see everybody in the room and how those reactions are taking place because it, it goes to credibility, it goes to coaching, it tells us a lot of um, things in the back of our head. I mean, we're watching a lot, we're watching a lot more than just a witness. And so I, um, I hope that answered your question, Joe, but I, I think that it, it, it depends, but I think we will see, um, and, and maybe even hybrids, I think we will see more and more where a witness will be zoomed in because it, it's not cost effective to bring them all the way to the, to the arbitration. Right. And more and more of us are just fine with that. Right, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree with everything you, you said, Patricia. Um, advocates much prefer in person hearings for the reasons you've given it's the reading of the body language in the room um when something's going going badly for the other side you, you first of all look to the other side's lawyers then you look to the face of the tribunal in fact a lot of time as you say is spent re reading everyone's reading everyone else's body language not only during the hearing which can be done to a certain extent online although not as well for the reasons you say but also in the breaks when the testimony stops how is everyone getting on as you I mean it, it lawyers easily forget as you say, the tribunal sees everything. And sometimes because it might be an elevated platform, it sees a bit more than everyone else. Um, but how, how, the, how the lawyers on one side interacting uh, during the break, um, how, how the, is the client rushing across the room to you know, tug the, the, the jackets of his lead advocate? Is it looking frantic? It's, all that happens and that's the, that's the humanity of a trial and that is lost uh, online, unfortunately. Yeah. Interesting, very interesting. Well, Pat, Joe, Ronan, uh, we are 10 minutes over, 11 minutes over. Uh, I'm going to uh, cut us off now because I, I want to keep it short. Um, I, but I do want to thank you all. Uh, this was a pleasure. Um, I joked with Ronan and, and the rest of you before we started that this was something I think we could spend hours speaking about because uh, this is sort of what we live for. But um, this has been wonderful. Thank you all. Um, Thank you, Rafa and the ICDR and I for helping us support this. Uh, thank you for the ABA Form of Construction Law, Society for Construction Law North America, and Y Construction for their support. Um, and with that, I think I'll, I'll sign off. But, but thank you all again. Great. Okay. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you, Pat.